Welcome everyone on this beautiful day. I'm Laura Peterson. This at the U at the Center series comes to you from the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Minnesota. Ali is a learning community for people 50 plus who are curious lifelong learners. We offer hundreds of non-credit courses a year, plus other ways to get involved like special interest groups and volunteer opportunities. I'm a volunteer too. I want to extend a warm welcome to our OLLI members who are on this webinar, as well as our guests. Today's presentation is titled, Could Climate Change Turn Minnesota into the New Kansas? with Dr. Lee Freilich. Dr. Freilich is director of the University of Minnesota Center for Forest Ecology. He has authored 200 publications with 275 co-authors from 25 countries. He's listed among the top 1% of all scientists in the world in ecology and environment by the web of science. His research has been featured in the news media 500 times, including the New York Times, Newsweek, and Washington Post. Current research interests include large scale fire and wind, earthworm invasion, and climate change in temperate and boreal forests. Dr. Freilich, I'll turn things over to you. Okay, well, I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, attending this afternoon. Let me just um, get into show mode here. There we go. So, um, yeah, can we, will we be the new Kansas? Well, I'll try to answer that question while we go through. Let's see, one more thing. I need to, whoops, one more thing that I need to um, click here. There we go. So um, this is a graph of global surface temperature. And as we know, temperatures have been going up. Um, there's an increase of about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit now. Um, so that's about one degree um, Celsius, and it reverses a 5,000 year natural cooling trend. And it's the highest CO2 level that we've had in about 3 million years. So there's no doubt that we're headed for a warmer climate. And then the question is, how high will the CO2 go, which depends on how much we emit, how much fossil fuels we burn as a society and how warm will it get? Well, here are two alternatives for high and low greenhouse gas emission scenarios um, by the end of the century. So looking on the left side here, we have a high emission scenario and it's a, in the center of North America, mean annual temperatures would go up about seven degrees uh, Celsius. And then on the up, opposite side here we have a low emission scenario where it might only get one degree warmer than it is um, today. So these would make a huge difference for Minnesota and you'll notice that in the center of a continent the changes are the biggest except for up near the, the North Pole but we're right in the middle of a continent here we're far away from the ocean we're at a fairly high latitude, and that means a relatively big magnitude of change compared to most of the globe, especially looking at places where people live. And so here's a, a map of Minnesota, and I have the, the natural vegetation of Minnesota here in terms of biomes. So biomes are the biggest map units that we have. And, it starts with Arctic tundra, which is furthest north, and then boreal forest, which is the, are the coldest forests in the world, and they go from central Alaska all the way across Canada, northern Scandinavia, and all across the northern part of Russia. So they dip down into Minnesota just a little bit, as you can see here, the dark green color, um, into northern Minnesota, which... Um, yeah, we have the bragging rights here, you know, for the coldest place outside of Alaska um, in the 48 states. 
and we have the boreal forest to prove it. And then we also have the next biome to the south, which is the temperate deciduous forest, which is mostly oak and maple and basswood, and that's the lighter green color. And then the, the kind of yellowish beige color there is grasslands. Of course, this is the, the, these are the areas where the climate would support these different biomes. The grassland biome is largely gone because it's been converted to agriculture. And the, a good part of the temperate forest biome is gone. Most of the boreal forest zone, though, uh, is still forest of some type because the climate and the soils there aren't as good for agriculture or other purposes. So the question here is maple, spruce, or savanna, asking the question, which of these three biomes um, are you going to have, depending on where you live in Minnesota, which do you have now and which might you have in the future? And particularly in northern Minnesota, could the boreal forest be replaced by maple forest or by savanna or grassland? Um, savanna just means grassland with a few trees in it. And it's interesting that ecologists consider Minnesota to be one of the most interesting places on the entire planet because we have three biomes coming together here. And we don't cheat by having mountains like they do in California. Yeah, they have several biomes, but they have mountains. We have three biomes in a flat landscape here, and it's very unique. Um, the other place in the, on the planet where you can find this is Kazakhstan, um, just south of the Ural Mountains, um, boreal forest and and temperate deciduous and grasslands also come together right there. So Minnesota is quite a unique place. We have a lot of edges, as you can see, and we know that edges of biomes are more likely to change in a changing climate because the margins of biomes or ecotones, as they're called, uh, are very sensitive to climate and because we have so many edges and we're the edgiest state in the Union, we could see a lot of change in Minnesota and as I showed on the last slide, we also expect a pretty large magnitude of change compared to most places. And what do these biomes look like? Well, here's the boreal forest. This is on the north shore of Lake Superior. A lot of you've probably stopped at the Tetagush rest stop and, and looked at this view. And what you see here is balsam fir and white spruce um, mixed with paper birch. Uh, and this forest type goes all the way to Alaska to the north and west, and it goes all the way out to um, Quebec and uh, Newfoundland going to the north and east. So a huge area. The, Boreal biome is actually the biggest terrestrial biome on the planet. It's a little bit bigger than the temperate biome or than the tropical rainforest biome. Okay, and here is a uh, temperate deciduous forest. This is south of the Twin Cities Cannon River Wilderness Area in southeastern Minnesota. It's a county park, um, probably Rice County, I'm thinking. And um, you can see it's very lush, uh, very closed canopy forest. And then here is, is a remnant of prairie. About 1% to 2% of our prairies are still in existence. And then the rest is either corn or soybeans or cities or highways. So if we look at the climate change that we expect in this region here, and again, I'm showing a high and low emission scenario, so this gives a little more detail than the global view I presented a few minutes ago. So the low emission scenario, we warm up by about, um, the orange there is between 5 and 6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this slide happens to be in Fahrenheit instead of Celsius because Don Wubbles, who is a one of these climate modelers who won the, the Nobel Prize in 2007 for writing the IPCC report at that time, the AR4 report. Um, he and I were using this slide in Washington, D.C., and they don't 
have Celsius in Washington, D.C. They only have Fahrenheit there. So we made a Fahrenheit slide. So five degrees warmer by the end of the century for the low emission scenario. That's about the best we can expect. That would make the Twin Cities about the same as Des Moines, Iowa. And then for the high emission, which is also known as business as usual, we'd be about 13 degrees warmer during summer. Uh, and that would take us to the middle of Kansas. So we could indeed become the new Kansas if we follow that high emission scenario. Um, yeah, a little town called Manhattan, Kansas, which is west of Kansas City, is about 13 degrees warmer than it is here in the Twin Cities. And why am I showing you summer temperature, June, July, and August? Well, it turns out that's what's most important for our ecosystems. It, it's the most important thing for, for the types of trees we have, um, whether we have tree or forest vegetation versus grassland vegetation. As we'll see in a minute, um, summer temperature is by far the most important impact. Our winters have already warmed up by six or seven degrees Fahrenheit in Minnesota, but vegetation is dormant during the winter. The, the vegetation really doesn't care if it's 20 below zero or 30 below zero or zero or 20 above zero. It's below freezing and it's dormant at that time. What really makes the difference is summer temperature. So what would that high emission scenario mean in terms of tree species? Uh, we think it would cause a movement of about 300 miles for the range limits of tree species. So on this slide, you see balsam fir, the blue line, which cuts through um, from northwestern Minnesota down to central Minnesota and then kind of turns east toward Wisconsin. That's the southern edge of the range limit for balsam fir. Um, in the map on the left, the red colors are where balsam fir is very abundant right now. Um, so it's not very abundant right at the edge of its range, but it's abundant when you get a 100 or 200 miles inside the range. And what would happen with the high emission scenario in 13 degrees warmer summer? Well, look at the lower map there. We wouldn't have any balsam fir in Minnesota. So the, the species would basically exit the state. It, it would grow maybe up by Lake Nipigon, but it wouldn't grow in, in Minnesota. Similar results occur for black spruce, white spruce, and paper birch. In other words, species of trees that are very boreal, trees that live in the coldest forest um, on the planet. So these are our boreal species, the, the most important ones in northern Minnesota. And in the upper left is black spruce, which is actually far more common in Minnesota than white spruce, um, which is over here on the, the upper right. And then we have red pine and paper birch. Jack pine is the lower left, balsam fir in the middle and the lower, and then quaking aspen in the lower right. So these are our most common boreal tree species, and, and they're all species that are fairly sensitive to a warming climate. And what would they be replaced with um, if we had that high emission scenario? Well, here are some of those species, and you're familiar with them. Whoops. Oh, sorry about that. From um, southern Minnesota, we have burr oak and sugar maple on the left. Elm, we actually have three species of elm in Minnesota, American elm, red elm, and rock elm. Um, they all have um, similar range limits. Red maple is the bottom middle. Then we have basswood on the top right, and then northern red oak in the lower right. So these are very common temperate species, and there's just a very little amount of them very sparing amount in northeastern Minnesota, but with that warmer climate, uh, they would grow much better in northern Minnesota. They would no longer be limited by summers that are too short. Um, so 
these are the replace potential replacement tree species um, if they're going to be trees at all but we'll get to that in a bit i should also point out that we get similar results for europe um, so this is some research that i worked on um, with my friends at the institute for dendrology dendrology just meaning the study of trees um, at the national academy of sciences in poland um, in poznan poland so we looked at norway spruce which is a really important species it shows its range now um, here in the green on the left and then on the right by 2070 for a business as usual or high emission scenario the entire red area would no longer have a climate that would support this extremely important tree species and the same for scots pine um, between norway spruce and scots pine you overwhelmingly have the far the most important timber species the most important species for being the foundation of ecosystems in the forests of Europe. Um, they would not grow in the central part of Europe. They would retreat even in southern Sweden and southern Finland, indicating that the boreal forest, the border between the temperate forest and boreal forest would move north uh, by a few hundred miles. So it's not just here, it's everywhere in the world where there's an ecotone between temperate and boreal biomes that this shift would occur. Um, getting back to Minnesota here and um, Wisconsin and Michigan as well, one of my students, Nick Fizzichelli, was a PhD student uh, and he's now the, the CEO of the Schudick Institute, which is an educational and research institute in Acadia National Park in Maine, but he did his PhD here. And he visited all of these locations, the black stars and the red triangles. And these are all places where some temperate and some boreal trees grow together side by side. So, for example, if you look at the red triangle up by Grand Marais in the very northeastern part of Minnesota, very cool summers there. And you know, there's just barely a tiny little bit of of temperate trees there and it's almost all boreal but you can still find places where they're growing side by side and you follow out to the edge of the prairie here uh, out by Bemidji and there it's almost all temperate trees almost all maple and oak and basswood but there's still a little bit of boreal and you again you can find places where temperate and boreal trees are growing side by side in the same forest and so we purposely wanted to look at these forests that are mixed, uh, have a mixture of trees between the two biomes and see how they respond to this temperature gradient from very cool summers to very warm summers, um, at least from the, the point of view of the boreal tree species. And so he looked at the growth rates of saplings and these are from one to five feet tall. So they represent the next generation of trees. When the big trees now die, what is in the understory will replace them. And so he looked at fir and spruce representing the boreal trees and red maple, sugar maple, and red oak representing the uh, temperate zone trees, looked at their ring growth, how fast are they increasing in diameter, and also the height growth. Um, and this is what he found. If you look across a summer temperature gradient from cool to warm summers, in the cool summer areas, balsam fir and spruce here are growing more than the two maple species, and uh, red oak is pretty much the same as red maple here. So, so if you have cool summers, fir and spruce grow more as a sapling, and therefore they outcompete and overtop and suppress the temperate species and so they're more likely to dominate the canopy and as you get to the warm part on the right side warmer summers um, the maple and oak are going to outgrow the spruce and fir and then there's a crossover point in the middle where they're about equal in terms of their ability to compete with each other and they can have true coexistence there over long periods of time 
So if you're in a place like Duluth from 1960 to 1990, it was summers were quite cool and you could expect spruce and fir to outgrow any temperate species. Um, now they're close to the crossover and in 10 or 15 years from now, they're gonna be in the warm zone here and, and uh, maple and oak will outgrow the boreal species and therefore be able to outcompete them and replace them over time. And here is a forest. This is in Wisconsin, but it's on the shore of Lake Michigan on the Door Peninsula, um, which has some very cold areas that are very cold in the summer. Not very cold in the winter because of the effect of Lake Michigan, but also because of the effect of Lake Michigan, quite cold in the summer because water 500 feet deep just offshore which stays 39 degrees Fahrenheit all summer, or all, yeah, all summer, upwells along the shore and creates a local cool climate. Well, in the 1970s, I visited this site and it was pure boreal. There was nothing but fir and spruce and cedar here. And then I go back in 2016, there's a sugar maple tree here on the right and it's growing in with balsam firs in the understory and it's, and it's doing just as well as the balsam fir. Um, so even the small amount of warming we've already had is tipping the balance in places that are close to that, that crossover temperature between temperate and boreal growth. So we're already seeing an impact of the warming we've already had. And in fact, wherever you have two adjoining or adjacent stands. One is temperate species, one is boreal species. The temperate species are invading the understory of the boreal, and that's with the warming that has already occurred. And of course, that will accelerate as warming continues. And of course, all of upper Michigan, northern Wisconsin, and most of northeastern Minnesota is in this zone where you have mixed patches of temperate and boreal forests. So trees are already responding to climate change. Okay, I said we would also talk about what if there are not any trees at all? What if we end up with a prairie climate that won't support boreal forest or temperate forest? So this was research was done by a different student, Nick Dons, and he's now a professor at the University of Wisconsin Superior and the problem for his PhD thesis is figure out what is the climate difference that makes the difference between having a forest or not having a forest. So if you look on the map on the left, those are all the green shows all the places that had trees at the time of the land survey. So the government did a land survey just before European settlers moved in. And in each township, they walked on the, the lines that divided into 36 square mile, uh, one square mile pieces of land. So each township is six by six miles. And they noted the species of trees um, everywhere where there's an intersection of those lines. Uh, so and then out in the prairie, there weren't any trees present. So it shows the, the prairie forest border as of the time of European settlement. And the climate factor that turned out to determine whether it's forest or prairie turns out to be the annual water balance and it's precipitation minus potential evapotranspiration, looking at the map on the right. Um, so, Precipitation, it's the, the amount of water that falls annually. It's around 30 inches in the Twin Cities. And then potential evapotranspiration, that's how much water evaporates and how much water does the vegetation pull out of the soil and, and transpire into the atmosphere. If those are close to zero, in other words, if precipitation and evaporation are equal, it's a zero water balance. And um, if there's more precipitation and evaporation, that's the green and blue areas on this map. 
and those are that's where the forests occur. Tur turns out that forests need a positive water balance, and you get pure grassland if there's a negative water balance on an ongoing basis. So here's the summary of of that. So temperate forest versus boreal forest in the bar on the top is dependent on mean summer temperature. So there's a crossover point at 64.6 .6 degrees mean temperature for June, July, and August. Um, you get mixed forest if it's right near that. If it's above 66.4, um, then you're going to get pure temperate forest, just oak and maple. And if it's colder than 62.4, if you're in a continental area like northern Minnesota, or 59.5, if you're in a maritime area like on the shores of the Great Lakes, then you'll have pure boreal forest. Okay, and then the climatic moisture index, um, zero is right at the prairie forest border. If there's at least a two inch per year deficit, you're going to have prairie and a two inch surplus, you're going to have forest and then, of course, mixed prairie and forest patches of them in be intermixed with each other in between. And how does that play out if you put it on a map? So we had a project where we did that and you can see the current biome layout in the map on the left here. Um, it shows Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, adjacent Ontario, Iowa, Illinois. And as you can see, the blue is boreal, pure boreal forest, and that's northeastern Minnesota, including the eastern half of the boundary waters. And then the minty green is mixed, so you have boreal trees and temperate trees mixed together. Um, and as you get Further to the south, those gradually disappear and it becomes pure broadleaf, which is the same as temperate deciduous forest. That's the yellow color. And then the brown is, the reddish brown is prairie. Um, it, you might notice that the prairie forest border now does not go from northwest to southeast in a diagonal across the state like it did, did at the time of European settlement way back in the mid 1800s. Uh, and that's because the, the climate wet enough to support trees is actually pushed further to the west because in the early phases of climate change, we've had an increase in rainfall, but not an increase in summer temperatures yet. So most evaporation occurs in summer. Our winters have warmed up, but our summers have not warmed up very much yet. So evaporation hasn't gone up and there's more rainfall. So it's a more forest friendly climate, even in the southwestern corner of Minnesota. Virtually all of Iowa is a forest climate now, whereas it used to be a prairie climate. But moving forward um, to 2070, whether we follow a low or high emission scenario for CO2, makes a huge difference in what Minnesota would look like because we're on the edges of biomes here. So for a low emission scenario, it'll warm up just a bit, a little bit more evaporation. The prairie pushes in a little bit from the west. It's not quite, a, quite cool enough to support as much boreal as we have now, but it doesn't disappear. Um, however, for the high emission scenario, where it gets 13 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the summer, the boreal completely disappears from Minnesota. So we lose a biome. Instead of three biomes, we only have two. The temperate deciduous forest, and this would be mostly oak with some maple, is in the arrowhead. And the rest of the state is a climate that would only support prairie. So um, and this is where the quote in the Washington Post came that um, they did a story about climate change in Minnesota two or three years ago, I think, and they quoted me as saying, uh, in the United States, we have a perfectly good Kansas right now, and we don't need a second Kansas in Minnesota, you know, which would be this whole 
basically the western two-thirds of Minnesota. It's just like taking Kansas and standing it upright and sliding it up to Minnesota. Why do we need a second Kansas? One is, is good enough. Um, so that would be a huge change for Minnesota. Um, so it makes a huge difference for the future in Minnesota because we're on the edges of biomes in what will happen in the state and then if you look continent wide you see the current distribution of the boreal which is kind of the the blue the light blue and the blue green and it's outlined by a heavy black line there and then by late century it would look like this one that's in the bottom center where a big chunk of what's now boreal forest would be grasslands turning from the, the light blue to to um, brown or temperate forest turning to yellow. And if we blow that up, again, the heavy black line here is the southern limit of the boreal forest now. That would, all of that from northwestern Minnesota up to Edmonton, Alberta, which is now boreal forest, would turn over to grassland. So all that forest would die. It would burn or rot and all of the carbon there would be emitted as CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's why the boreal forest prairie biome in the center of North America is listed as one of the tipping points for the earth in the IPCC report, the latest one that just is coming out this year um, and in recent papers that have been published. And then there's a huge area here which would also go from boreal forest to the yellow, which is temperate deciduous. Altogether, it's about five times the size of Minnesota. Um, that would be converted from boreal forest to another biome, and that would be a huge amount of carbon from all that dead boreal forest going into the atmosphere. And it would be a tipping point because even if we limited CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels, at that point we would not be able to control the CO2 content of the atmosphere because all that CO2 from those dying forests would be going into the atmosphere. And what does this mean? Um, now, in, um, another way to look at this is what we call a climate analog. So, for example, if you look at the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness today, which is the blue star here, what do you find if you go to a place that right now has a summer temperature that is what we expect the Boundary Waters to have by the year 2070? So you do that and you find the orange star. In this case, it's about four degrees um, um, Celsius or eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer, mean summer temperature, um, granite falls. And the physiography there is very similar to the boundary waters. There are big outcrops of granitic bedrock. So it has that in common. So the only difference is the mean summer temperature. So here's what you get in the boundary waters. Um, this is black spruce forest. And I see there's some paper birch here on the extreme right. Looks like there's a few jack pines, a few fir trees, but it's mostly black spruce and it's growing on um, granitic bedrock that's about 2.7 billion years old. And um, let's see, you go to nice outcrops natural area near granite falls and nice is g-n-e-i-s-s -S. it's a type of rock um, not to say that it's not also nice n-i-c-e it's very nice nice i guess um, and that's why it was was um, turned into a natural area but it's a granitic rock that was metamorphosed and it's 3.6 billion years old um, one of the oldest rock outcrops on the entire planet. Very similar chemistry of the soil, physiographic land features to what you have in the boundary waters. So the only difference here 
is about eight degrees Fahrenheit in summer temperature. Um, so that's the difference that makes and you have scattered oaks and there's kind of open grassy and shrubby vegetation in between. If you warmed it up a couple more degrees, it would be almost pure grassland uh, because of the extremely high evaporation. So in addition to the warmer summer temperatures, uh, when, when you start having more summer evaporation, trees are under drought stress. So you see the upper picture here is dead birch trees. If you've driven up Highway 61 in northern Minnesota, you've seen some of the um, uh, 20 million or so dead birch trees that died during droughts in the early 2000s. So trees under drought stress likely to die. Just from drought stress, um, they can't defend themselves from insects when they're under drought stress, so there tends to be insect outbreaks as well, or disease outbreaks of various types. The beetle shown here is the mountain pine beetle, which is kind of interesting. It is a native beetle in Western North America. It, um, lives in lodgepole pine, ponderosa pine uh, forests in the west, the kind of the Mount, Rocky Mountain part of the United States and British Columbia, Canada. And with the warmer winters, it's had an outbreak. Longer summers means it can reproduce more during the summer. Warmer winters means it's not wiped out by extreme cold it's killed at about minus 40 and there were several winters in a row where it didn't get that cold and so it had an outbreak and it killed about 40 or 50 million acres of forest in british columbia and the adjacent parts of the united states now this beetle could come to minnesota it could move across um, Saskatchewan and Manitoba and reach Minnesota and, and um, we had a graduate student who studied whether this beetle would be able to colonize and kill our species of pine in Minnesota because our jack pine is closely related to the lodgepole pine out west and uh, he took jack pine trees cut them down in in Minnesota put them on a truck took the trunks out to the Black Hills, which has mountain pine beetle, and discovered that they could colonize jack pine very easily. Um, and the same for red pine and white pine. Red pine is kind of like ponderosa pine, and our white pine is kind of like white bark pine out west. So, um, so yes, these beetles can kill our pine trees if they get here. The only thing is it's still too cold in Minnesota for them, but as it continues to warm, um, they might be able to survive the winters crossing Saskatchewan and Manitoba in the northern Minnesota. Um, in 2019, during the polar vortex event that we had, it was down to minus 50 in many places in northern Minnesota, and it was down to minus 56 in a town called Cotton which is between Duluth and Virginia. So it's still a little bit too cold here. So we still have our breaking rights in Minnesota, but that might not last forever in a warming climate. Um, and then the lower left picture here shows what happened in the Boundary Waters when we had a severe fire in a wind-thrown area. Wind throw never used to occur in the boreal forest because severe thunderstorms that produce these big downbursts didn't occur that far north and now they do and if you blow down a boreal forest and then burn it all the pine cones are on the ground and they're consumed in the fire and the pines are exterminated uh, and what comes back is basically birch aspen so this combination of disturbances is already changing the boreal forest from conifers into birch and aspen and in the future maybe into maple and oak or maybe even grasslands depending exactly how much it warms up <clears throat> so another factor if you remember march of 2012 um, 
during spring break that year, which is the second or third week of March, the students in my class went to um, places like Texas and Florida during spring break. It was in the 60s there and it was 85 in the Twin Cities. So when they came back, I said, what did you go to Florida for? It was much warmer here in Minnesota. And um, because of this very odd jet stream pattern, it was cold out west and a big ridge, very warm in the eastern US. And that is exactly what happened in the last six days this spring. It didn't happen as early as it did in 2012, though. You know, it's mid April now, and it's not as far out of normal to have it get up to 88 degrees in April as it is in March. But anyway, um, it's very upsetting for boreal tree species to come out of dormancy in March. Um, and I'll show that on the next slide, but here you can see in 2012 magnolias in bloom in March on St. Paul campus. And here's what happened in northern Minnesota. On the upper picture, you see one of our study areas in the Boundary Waters, and it shows balsam fir and jack pine, and it's all turned brown. And then there's a spruce forest near um, Thunder Bay, Ontario, in the lower picture. It all turned brown because it came out of dormancy too early. It came out of dormancy in March. And then was not tolerant of the temperatures when the temperatures went back to normal in late March and early April. So the needles were all killed. Now, what happened in, in this particular case is that um, this, the next three or four springs were actually normal timing and the trees lost their needles, but they grew new needles. They had energy stored up in the roots. And even though the needles live five or six years, over five or six years, they built their the, the amount of foliage back up to normal. If this occurred two, twice, two springs in a row, all this forest would have been killed. And it would have been killed from Minnesota all the way out to, to Labrador. And we have coined the new term phenological disturbance. Phenology means the timing of biological events. And one of those events is what is the timing of when trees come out of dormancy when they're really hardened against the cold, then they come out of dormancy and they lose that ability to tolerate cold and they're ready to start growing. What happens when that occurs at the wrong time? So it's a phenological mismatch. And for one thing, boreal trees can't use a six month growing season. They can only use a three month growing season. They don't know what to do with the extra three months. Um, and the other is, they can, even though they are the most cold tolerant trees on the planet, ironically, they could come out of dormancy and then die from freezing damage by coming out of dormancy too early. So their phenology or their timing would be off because of the changing climate. And of course, when you change the vegetation, um, the factors that I just showed you like insects, forest fires, droughts, um, phenological changes, those would all just reinforce and maybe accelerate the changes from one biome to another that would be caused by the basic change in climate due to the changing water balance and the changing mean summer temperature that I talked about earlier. Those things could accelerate that hugely. Um, you know, they're just other factors that could work in concert with a warming climate. Uh, but when you change the vegetation, you also change the wildlife. All wildlife species live in vegetation and they either eat plants or they eat another wildlife species that does eat plants, right? There's no, there's no escape here. You can't unlink the vegetation to the species of wildlife that live in a given area. 
um, not to mention the adaptations of wildlife species directly to the climate. For example, moose live in boreal forests, whereas winters in the boreal are too long. For deer, the snow can be too deep. Moose have longer legs, they have a bigger body, they're way more tolerant of cold. Uh, but if you change the vegetation and have warmer summers, moose can get heat stroke, and so they would be replaced by deer, which is the member of the deer family that occurs just to the south. Deer are essentially a temperate zone uh, species of wildlife. Moose are a boreal species of wildlife. And for the cats, um, lynx are boreal and bobcats are temperate. And we're seeing bobcats moving into northern Minnesota with the temperature change that's already happened. Um, and then for birds, there are hundreds of examples that could be used. Uh, and I picked one of my favorite, the black-backed woodpecker, uh, which specializes in boreal forests that have just burned. They really like recently dead trees that are full of insects that they can peck into the bark, under the bark, and find these dead insects that are their food source. Well, they could be replaced by red-bellied woodpecker, which is a temperate zone woodpecker. So yeah, I made this um, slide actually for Amy Klobuchar, and she was giving a speech on the floor of the Senate, and this was five or six years ago, I think, um, about um, climate change, obviously, and I made this slide for her, and it what it shows is my estimation of the level at which the Senate might possibly be able to understand climate change. Um, you know, if it affects a, a nice furry animal of some sort or a bird, it maybe they'll think it's important. Okay, so we've seen how the vegetation might change for low and high scenarios we've seen the ancillary factors that could accelerate any change that does occur um, i wanted to say a little bit about all the big forest fires that we've had in minnesota in recent years and so this shows them the greenwood fire 2021 um, near isabella Pagami creek 2011 92,000 acres um, Cavity Lake, 2006, 32,000 acres, and Ham Lake, 72,000 acres in 2007. And the question is, is this recent increase in the occurrence of big fires an early sign of changing climate? So we didn't have fires this big basically since 1910. Um, from 1910 all the way to the early 2000s, we did not have a lot of big fires like this and now it's happening and is this the early stages of what's been happening out in california and oregon which with these huge fires in extreme droughts or not well um if you look at the the fire cycle in the boundary waters for example and all these fires are either in or near the boundary waters if you look at the fire cycle before European settlement, it was about 122 years. In other words, 0.8% burned every year and it'd take 122 years to burn the whole landscape. During European settlement, it went down to 87 years. There were more fires. Settlers obviously set fires. Um, indigenous people who were living there also set fires, but they tended to do um, controlled understory fires in order to create red pine forests with blueberries in the understory as a source of food. Um, they didn't, or at least they tried not to and were very successful at not accidentally setting fires that would burn the whole landscape. Unlike European settlers who didn't know anything about fire behavior. And then there was this exclusion period from 1911 to the 1970s. Some people would say it goes to the 1990s. 2000 year fire cycle. And now in the contemporary period, if you look at contemporary A there from 2000 to 2021, we've got 
about 1% burned annually and back to a 100 year fire cycle. So very similar to the pre-European settlement period. Um, so what's going on here? Um, so we've, what happened is we've returned to the historic fire frequency from the 1700s to 1910. Is this just a return to normal or is it a step towards a new tipping point and even higher frequencies of fires and change in the boreal forest? And we really don't know. It's, we're going to have to wait and see. Um, there just isn't enough data yet. The change hasn't been in effect long enough. We do know that the low frequency of fire in the 1900s um, happened because fire was excluded because so much of the landscape was logged, changed to birch and aspen, which is less flammable, and there was fire suppression. I mean, fire departments started to exist. Um, the indigenous burning by indigenous people um, disappeared as a force on the landscape. A lot of things happened. And the climate also was different during that period. So there were several things that were different. Um, and we now have historical perspective on that exclusion period, but looking at these changes is, is inherently historical and you, there, we just don't have enough data yet to know we're just going back to normal from pre-settlement or this is the start of the effect of climate change. So we don't really know. Although this particular analysis from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, where the National Weather Service is, shows their estimation of where the frequency of big fires, that's fires more than 12,500 acres, will increase in the future. The dark red is where a 600% increase in the frequency of big fires is likely occur to occur um, in 2041 to 2070 compared to 1971 to 2010. Do you see anything of interest on this map? Um, yeah, I mean, northern Wisconsin, upper Michigan, and northern Minnesota show up in that dark red where they're predicting a 600% increase. And of course, this is for a business as usual CO2 emission scenario that if we do have these more severe droughts and longer summers, we will indeed see big fires. Right now, it's just a prediction. Maybe the increase in recent fires is the start towards this, or maybe not, we don't know yet. And you'll notice that California and Oregon, they're not predicted to have a big an increase. Well, that's because they've already had a 600% increase out there. So they don't expect a lot a further increase in the frequency of big fires. So there's a hint there, um, meteorologists are predicting an increase. Um, with the business as usual scenario, we become the new Kansas by 2070. How can we prevent that? What can you do to reduce climate change as a person? People ask me this all the time. If you want to reduce CO2 emissions as a individual person, my advice is eat more plants. Um, a lot of CO2 emissions go into the atmosphere because of animal agriculture. It's really hard for me to say that because if you go back a couple of generations, my family was dairy farmers, but nevertheless, the facts show that this is true. If people eat more plants, it will reduce CO2 emissions. Um, more energy efficient cars and buildings, the switch to EVs will help with that. Switch to alternative energy, solar and wind for electricity and heat. Stopping deforestation is a big one, and this one is, in, is intertwined with animal agriculture because the main reason for deforesting the Amazon is, is to um, have lands for more cattle grazing. But we need to stop deforestation everywhere in the world because just the basic deforestation without even considering what land use it becomes after it's deforested is a big source of CO2. And of course, plant trees, which take CO2 out of the atmosphere, 
So potential tree cover in the world is 10.9 billion acres, which are the blue and the green areas. They, those areas all have climates that can support forest. The currently existing tree cover is 6.9 billion acres. So there's 4 billion acres there. Um, we need some of that for agriculture, regardless of, of whether we eat mostly plants or, or whatever. However, there's 2.2 billion acres that is suitable for forests that we don't need for agriculture. And that's about 6% of the Earth's land surface in the area about the size of the United States. So there's 2.2 billion acres out there that we could fill with new forests. It would take about a trillion trees to do that. Um, and that might sound pretty daunting, but it's actually only a hundred, little more than a hundred trees, maybe 110 or 120 new seedlings being planted per person. And can we plant 100 seedlings per person in the next 10 or 20 years on this planet? And the answer is, of course we can. We just have to decide to do it. So um, <clears throat> those are the alternative futures based on CO2 emission scenarios and how to change the business as usual CO2 scenario to a low emission scenario. And just to end with this picture, my uh, friend David Luke is a professor of photography and he took digital photos of iconic scenes in the boundary waters and digitally erased the part above the water and replaced it with prairie or savanna from south southwestern Minnesota. But it shows the boreal forest that's there now reflected in the water, um, just as a way to show people what the alternatives are. We go on a low emission scenario, the boundary water stays as a coniferous forest. We go on a high emission scenario, it becomes a an, an oak savanna. Um, so that's, I'm, if there's time, I would be happy to take questions. All right. Wow, thank you. This is not an uplifting presentation. Yeah, no, you I have to say, very sure. important and interesting. Um, yeah. So earlier in your presentation, you were showing us some maps of the boreal forest southern edges based on, you know, today versus the future. Mm -hmm. Did those maps take into account other changes that would occur besides temperature to the boreal forest? For example, the increased pest uh, disease that might happen to those forests with warmer temperatures? Um, no, they just, it's just the climate envelope in which boreal forest could grow. Uh, and to tell you the truth, scientists don't even know how we would model all the multiple interacting factors. Mm. Because, you know, if the climate warms, there'll be more insect pests, there'll be more diseases, trees will be under drought stress, like I mentioned. The phenology will change, the springs will be too early, all these other things will change. Um, we're not anywhere near advanced enough in our knowledge to model all those things together. So, um, in fact, those maps that I showed you were pretty groundbreaking and, you know, they were done in my lab. And that's just the climate envelope. In this climate, you could grow boreal forest and it doesn't take into account whether the soil is the right type or insects or windstorms or forest fires or any of that stuff. Um, Maybe by the time my graduate students are my age, we will be able to model things that complicated. So the scenario might be much worse even than what you've presented. Yeah, well, I would, I would see those other factors mostly as an accelerant. You mm -hmm. know, if there's a bunch of boreal forest that no longer has a climate that can possibly support it, it could just die gradually because the trees that are there now wouldn't be replaced by boreal trees. They'd be replaced by something else gradually over a century. But if you get an insect outbreak, 
and a big windstorm and a forest fire and an extreme drought, it might just make the change happen in a few years instead of in a hundred years. So it would just accelerate it. Okay. Uh, does higher evaporation cause grassland or is it the other way around? Does more grassland cause a higher evaporation? Um, higher evaporation causes grassland and basically it's because trees cannot tolerate an environment. They can't grow in a place where there's more evaporation than there is precipitation. They could grow on river valleys or something, you know, where there's a different source of water other than precipitation. Like you can find a row of cottonwood trees going across North Dakota and South Dakota, you know, on the Missouri River. Um, but they have to have a surplus of water over evaporation because they cool themselves in the summer through evaporation. And if they can't cool their leaves through evaporation, then they can't open the stomata, which are the little pores in order to take in carbon dioxide in order to grow and make wood. So it's a, just a simple physiological thing there that trees have to have an abundance of water compared to grasses. Okay. You know, a, gra a grass can go dormant and the above ground part can die. The root can stay alive and when the drought ends, it can sprout again, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if the top of a tree dies, you just lost the, the structure that took a hundred years to build. Um, so it doesn't work very well if trees, the above ground part dies. Um, it, you know, it just um, doesn't match up with a, with an arid climate that has too much evaporation because if you're a tree you can't afford to lose your trunk all the time just because you're in the wrong climate. Uh, so uh, two questions here that are really related to each other. Uh, you know, you're, you're saying we absolutely need to plant trees, but um, it seems that if we plant the wrong kind of trees, we're, they're just going to die from climate change. So what types of trees should we be planting here? Yeah, well, this is where the, the types of trees is going to vary in every location around the world, and you need local knowledge from foresters or indigenous people of the trees everywhere in the world in order to figure out to match the right tree to the right soil type and the right climate. Um, you know, we have a project in Madagascar called Green Again Madagascar. It's associated with the University of Minnesota. Uh, and we, it's a 501c3 here in the US and we raise donations here. And we spend 95% of the money in Madagascar and we actually employ 80 local people in Madagascar. And we have several nurseries growing 58 species of trees. And they're all native to Madagascar at least a third of them don't even have a scientific name. They haven't even been given a species name yet, but the local people in Madagascar have their name for them and we are using those names and they know how to grow the seedlings. They know where that each species should be planted. Should it be a hilltop? Should it be in a swamp? Should it be on sandy soils or not sandy soils? They have, they know all that just because they've been living there as indigenous people. So you need that indigenous knowledge um, everywhere in the world. Um, here in Minnesota, if you're close to the prairie forest border, I would say go ahead and plant oak trees. They're very drought tolerant. And maybe we can sequester enough carbon to stop climate change from being as large a magnitude as it might otherwise be. Um, so, but yeah, if climate change does start happening very rapidly, the acreage that will support trees will suddenly start to plummet and will be, you know, we will have lost the race, you know, in order to, to save the planet. But right now, if we plant that 2.2 billion acres of, with trees in the next 20 years, will get ahead of the curve and they will be taking huge amounts of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere for the next 50 or 60 years. And probably if, if we did that, we could blunt the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere by 100 parts per million. 
In other words, we could keep it in the low 400s for three or four decades, and that would give us enough time to switch to renewable energy. So that's how I see the value of trees. If we plant enough of them, we can limit the increasing CO2 trajectory enough to give us time to switch to renewable energy. Are there organizations out there right now that are helping spearhead this? I mean, I don't know how, how to go about planting 120 seedlings. Yeah, there are. I mean, there, there's plant for the planet. Um, and they, it's a worldwide organization. It was started by a teenage kid in Germany 10 or 12 years ago. It's called Plant for the Planet. And if you go to their website, there's a map of the world and you can zoom in on any part of the world and there's places that you can click on and it will show you a picture of the site. It will show you who is planting trees locally and you can donate money directly to that site. Um, so you can go to Madagascar and you can choose Green Again Madagascar and donate money to our project. But there are, there are tree planting projects all over the world and it's part of the Trillion Tree Project. Um, and all of these sites are very um, rigorously vetted by the Plant for the Planet organization. Like you have to be planting native trees, they have to be appropriate for the site, you have to remove the weeds that might compete with them. If some of them die, you need to replace them, you know, because some trees die in the first few years after planting. It's not like plant and abandon. And you have to pay fair salaries to the local workers who are planting them. You have to get advice from the local foresters or indigenous people about what species are appropriate. Um, and basically, they took all of those criteria from our project <laughs> and said, you're doing it right. Let's just make those the criteria for everybody, all these tree planting projects in the world. Um, so because you know, we started our project right at the same time as Plant for Planet was getting going and, um, and they learned as they went. So now it's a very good, good worldwide project. Yeah, and then there are government agencies like the US Forest Service and there are private um, organizations like Nature Conservancy, which is Nature Conservancy and um, is the, probably the biggest nonprofit in the world. And they're doing a lot of tree planting in various places on land that they own that needs to be reforested. Um, and there are local organizations um, like Great River Greening is a local organization in the Twin Cities that plants at the site level. For example, they filled some of the open fields at Afton State Park with new forest, you know, at the request of the park. And so they raise money from donations because they're a nonprofit. They provide the expertise. They get local people to turn out as volunteers who are directed by their um, staff who have master's degrees in forestry or ecology to make sure that it's done correctly. Um, yeah, so there's Great River Greening. There's um, Friends of the Mississippi River also does that in the metro area. The area, some areas need to be reforested. They're also restoring prairies too, which is fine because prairies sequester carbon in the soil. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with restoring prairies in areas that where the soil type is appropriate, where the soil and climate are appropriate for prairie, um, in addition to restoring trees. So there's a lot going on with nonprofit organizations locally and globally. Um, so you don't have to worry about all the details. All you have to do is either turn out as a volunteer for a Great River Greening event or donate some money to them. Um, one, of our, uh, one of our audience members has also noted that uh, there's a browser called Ecosia or Ecosia. It's E-C-O-S-I-A. It's a browser like Safari or Chrome that plants trees when you use it for web searches. So, hmm. yeah, I've heard of that. Um, 
So yeah, there, there are surely things that I, beyond where, where I have detailed expertise. I mean, there's a lot going on. Uh, okay, so somebody wants to know, how much would it cost to plant 2.2 billion acres of trees? Um, well, <laughs> it, it's hard to sum that up because the costs are different depending, uh, you know, in Madagascar, it's kind of cheap to plant trees because the, the amount of value you get for a US dollar when you spend it in Madagascar is huge. Um, so the, the funding, the cost varies so much among, among different places. I'm not sure that anybody has summed that up. But my guess from just looking through all the different sites on Plant for the Planet, my guess is it end up being a couple dollars per tree on average probably. Um, so including the nursery cost and the planting cost and the monitoring it for the first few years after it's planted, it might be two or three dollars a tree. So um, and if it was a trillion trees, so it'd be two or three trillion dollars. But that is a very rough guess. But that's still small compared to the global economy. And it would be over a decade or more. So it wouldn't be that much per year. Is there a way to build heat tolerance into boreal trees? Probably there is. Um, <laughs> there, I mean, there, there's actually variability in, in temperature tolerances across the ranges of trees. You know, for example, if you, if you pick a white spruce tree in northern Wisconsin and compare it to a white spruce tree in the Yukon Territory, um, the one in Wisconsin can withstand warmer summers, longer summers um, than the one that's coming from the Yukon Territory. So there are what we call ecotypes. And almost all species of trees have ecotypes. And that's one reason why you need local expertise to make sure that you're planting the right ecotype for your area. And there's a lot of talk now for forestry agencies, you know, like the National Forest Service, are they going to start taking seed sources from, say, 100 miles further south? Should the Superior National Forest in northern Minnesota start taking seed sources from St. Cloud or from the Twin Cities? And there's a lot of research going on on what the best um, strategy is there. Interesting. So uh, whether you can get a boreal tree to grow in Alabama or something like that. I kind of doubt that. Or whether you can get them, I mean, they're even with the ecotypic variability throughout the range, there's still going to be a limit. You know, you're, you're not going to be able to get a white spruce tree to grow in the middle of Kansas. Um, every species has some sort of a limit. We do know how to engineer heat tolerance into corn. You know, there are varieties of corn that have high degrees of, of heat tolerance that can be planted in a warmer climate, but corn is an annual plant and you can go through the genetic selection and trials that you need in several years. And you can't do that for a tree because you have to grow the tree until it's mature enough to get seeds and then grow another generation and another generation, you know, in order to select for for more and more heat tolerance. And there just isn't time to do that because it would take 100 years or 200 years. Their life cycle is just too long. Yeah. OK, well, I know that you, <clears throat> that you are a tree and a forest expert. But one of our audience members has asked uh, that if you know what effect climate change might have on Minnesota's lakes and aquifers. Yeah, I actually get that question fairly often. And I'm not a limnologist, but I've talked to some of my friends who are limnologists. And um, the answer is it would vary tremendously depending on the shape of the watershed in the basin of each lake. Um, so lakes that are in 
say the shallow lakes like we have in west central Minnesota, they would be in danger of drying up and either becoming marshlands or even dry land if they're shallow and they're dependent on groundwater because groundwater levels could fall several feet. If it's a lake that's fed by streams, then during heavy rain events, it might still fill until it reaches the, the level of the outflow, you know, the lip over which it needs to outflow. And so it really depends whether or not they'll dry up depends on the, the configuration of the basin and whether it's a groundwater lake or whether it's being fed by streams. And then in terms of the temperature regime, they would all warm up. And so they all have mixtures of species of fish that live in warmer and colder parts of the lake. And so those abundances would shift. So the, the ones adapted, the more of the volume of the water in a lake is going to be warmer water temperature and a warmer climate and the fish that do well at that temperature would expand at the expense of fish that like cold water you know so things like lake trout and cisco would not do very well they might even disappear from minnesota um, but you'd have a shift in species towards those that like warmer water. You might have to do some moving around of fish species, which is something we've been doing for at least a century. I mean, the DNR stocks different lakes with, with fish. And so we're used to doing that. We're used to raising millions of fish in fish nurseries and stocking different lakes and so presumably we could use the knowledge gained from doing that to adjust the fish species to to the new water temperatures okay um so if we go back to focus just on the u.s with all that potential um uh reforested acreage you showed us a, a picture of the a map of the world but do you have any idea how much acreage is potentially reforestable in the U.S. itself? Well, let's see. I don't have the exact total with me um, right now. Um, it's something I could look up, but I, it's millions of acres in the U.S., especially in the eastern U.S. and the Pacific Northwest. Um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan have quite a bit of land that is, is not used for agriculture and could be reforested. It's usually in a lot of scattered smaller parcels, but it adds up to a lot of acreage. Um, so I can't give you an exact total, but there are millions of acres in the United States that, that could be forested. You know, Great River Greening and Friends of the Mississippi River and Nature Conservancy are not having any problems finding places to reforest right now. Um, and even if they had all the money they could possibly use, it would probably take them a couple decades before they could exhaust all the sites where they could plant trees. We have enough seeds to do all this replanting? Um, for some species, we do. I mean, there are the Minnesota DNR has um, seed orchards. And those mostly cover species of trees that people either like or that the timber industry wants. But it's not all that hard to develop seed orchards. Um, you know, just like some farmers grow seed corn. And you can also gather seeds in the wild. So, um, you know, hire people just to go out and gather seeds of of species that you're interested in because some seeds don't store well and they only occur on very mature trees so you have to go out in the field and gather seeds but um, foresters know how to do all those things okay well once again stepping aside from your role as a forester do you have any um any opinions knowledge on um population change and how uh that will affect climate change? And if so, how would reducing the population impact climate change? Yeah, well, the, the, the population times the per person emissions of CO2 
determines the total amount of CO2 emitted, right? So, um, <clears throat> I mean, in theory, we could reduce CO2 emissions to zero, regardless of how many people there are, because we know that it's possible to make a zero carbon lifestyle for people. Um, but it would be easier if there were fewer people, right? Um, because it would take a, a lot of time to do that. So, um, and you would be, the CO2 content of the atmosphere would be going up while you were in the process of trying to get people to a zero emission lifestyle. So it's a product of both. I mean, it's always gonna be easier with fewer people. Um, and um, personally, I don't think the population of the world is gonna grow much more, you know, cause there are a lot of countries have um, lower birth rates now, and there's only a few countries in the world that are still growing at a, where the population is still growing at a high rate. So we're gonna stabilize in the, probably in the next several decades in terms of population. But we can't wait for several decades to reduce CO2 emissions, so we might as well mostly work on on um, getting people's lifestyle to a zero carbon emission. And you know, most of the people in the world don't like to be told whether they're going to have children or not anyway. So we might as well concentrate on the my personal philosophy is concentrate on getting a high quality lifestyle with zero carbon emissions. You know, Is that possible? People don't like to be told what their diet should be, and they don't like oh. to be told how many children they should have. I, see. Um, I, I tell people they should eat plants anyway, because we can grow enough plants to feed 10 billion people on half the acreage that we can with animal agriculture. And that would free up even more land for reforesting. So, we have a speaker coming up in a few weeks who's going to talk to us about eating insects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't sound very appealing to me. I mean, I, I have a, an almost totally vegan diet and I'm really happy with it. I don't need insects. And it's lower on the food chain. Yeah. So, so okay. yeah, I mean, insects bioconcentrate all the toxins and stuff that we spray out there. I'll and make sure I ask. If you eat plants, you're at the lowest level in terms of bioconcentration of toxins. Um, so that's what I recommend. Um, okay. Uh, do you think that we're doing enough now as uh, a country to be on that low CO2 emission line that you had earlier, you had low and high? Um, no, we're not doing enough yet. Okay. I think the the um, the big bill that was passed um, about a year ago is um, is a really good step and it's the first really significant step but i just worry about how it's going to be implemented uh, you know or whether that money will go off into various forms of corruption um, and there, that it will actually be implemented and it's a really good first step but it's not by any means all that we need to do um, so i think the the better the education level on on the issue and the more people do things on their own you know such as support organizations that plant trees and reducing their own emissions from their you know from heating and air conditioning their house and so on and and from um, transportation emissions. If everybody starts doing that on their own, it'll ultimately have a bigger impact than if it comes from the top down. It's much better if people decide it's good for them financially and health-wise and for the good of their children and grandchildren, health-wise and financially, than to be told by the government that you should, should do it. Do you feel that overall this message is getting out more? I, I, you know, even six years ago, we had lots of people who said there's no such thing as as man caused climate change. Is that yeah. changing? Yeah, I, I think progress is being steadily made. 
in terms of the proportion of people who think it's a significant problem and that we should do something about it. Yeah, it's been frustratingly slow, but there's a s slow, steady increase in people um, who think it's important and who are willing to take some action uh, personally and in who they vote for. So um, mm -hmm. it, I wish it was happening faster, but but there is pro progress being made um, compared to when I was in graduate school or compared to 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I can say a lot more things now when I give a speech without having people throw rotten tomatoes at me. <laughs> um, it used to be that I, I talked about climate change in the, at a Rotary Club about 15 years ago, when half the people got up and walked out. And now I get invited to speak to Rotary Clubs and people are enthusiastic about doing something about the climate change issue. Um, so that tells me that there's a slow, steady change in society. You know, when the Rotary Clubs flipped, uh, that, <laughs> that something is actually happening. Are you are you willing to share with us the uh, other things that you personally do to live near a zero emissions life? You mentioned you're on a vegan diet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I do have a car, but I only use it when I'm going on out of town trips. So all local travel is on foot or by uh, light rail or bus. I live in an 885 square foot condo in downtown Minneapolis. Um, everything that I need in my personal life is available within two blocks. I mean, people who think downtown Minneapolis is empty are kind of wrong about that. There's actually like 400 stores in downtown Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are banks and hair salons and everything that you can possibly think of. And there's like five grocery stores now and 10 corner store types. And, and uh, even with the closure of eight caribou coffee shops, there's still like 25 coffee shops. There's still like one on every block. You don't really need two on every block. So yeah, I and I really enjoy interacting with people on foot, you know, seeing other people and talking to them and and um, sometimes um, I get off the light rail and it takes me two or three hours to get home because I run into a dozen people and stop and talk to each one for 10 minutes. <laughs> one time it one time I got off the light rail at at four in the afternoon and I didn't get home until 11 p.m. Oh my gosh. Um, because I talked to several people and then I ran into somebody who invited me over for dinner. <laughs> and then after that, I ran into somebody who invited me to, to go to a concert or something. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, it's a really fun type of lifestyle and it can be done anywhere. Yeah, I mean, you can make neighborhoods all over the place. It doesn't have to be downtown. You can make walkable neighborhoods that have local businesses everywhere, I think. I mean, maybe it'd be hard to do it in rural areas. You'd, you'd still be some distance, but um, you can certainly do it in, in the metro area. Well, I know that you have other commitments right after this. So um, despite the fact that we have a ton more questions, um, I am going to say that sadly we are out of time, but I wanna thank you very much, Dr. Freilich, for all the information you've given us. The audience always has great questions as well. And thank you to Ollie for putting this program on. And uh, to the attendees, please join us next week when we're gonna have a presentation by Dr. Chris Pinnell called The Evolution of Cancer Therapy. And then possibly the week after that is the insect one, but stay tuned for that. That'll be interesting as well. Thank you all again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.